Daniel walked over to the window and stared out at the scene below. Various railway buildings, storage depots and engine sheds, all covered in black soot. The only things that seemed to have any shine on them were the railway tracks. Here were the gritty inner workings of a busy metropolis, tucked away behind tall tenement-like buildings and out of view from the public gaze. The stained and blackened bronchi of a city choking on the pollution of its own excess. London, prior to the 1970s, was black. All the buildings were covered in an accumulation of soot and grime that had been pumped out over the centuries by coal fires, steam engines and latterly coal-fired power stations. Then Daniel's attention was drawn to a train approaching and to him it looked like it was wearily wending its way into Paddington, dragging its feet as if it was reluctant to reach its final destination. And of course, practically the whole of the 60s was acted out to the backdrop of the Vietnam War, probably one of the most divisive and controversial wars of all time. In fact, looking at the 60s in the cold light of day, it was a very violent and turbulent decade. Race riots in the United States, the assassination of President Kennedy and his brother Robert, the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Prague Spring, the Cold War and the threat of total annihilation, the Sharpeville Massacre and civil unrest practically everywhere you looked. But even so, the 60s will always remain associated in popular culture with a genuine renaissance of music, the like of which the world had not seen before and probably wouldn't see again for some considerable time, along with the ideals of flower power and sexual liberation. This is bad, man. I've never seen anyone have such a bad reaction as this. He's given me the horrors too. If he doesn't calm down, this is going to turn into a bad trip for all. Ay! Lyra stopped him dead in his tracks with a blood-curdling scream. He's climbing out the window. Stop him, stop him. They both rushed over to the window where Daniel was halfway out, with one leg already over the sill and the other one just about to go over. Jeff grabbed him around the chest and tried to yank him back in, but Daniel gripped tightly onto the window frame and resisted screaming, I need more air! I need more air! Lyra tried to prise his fingers from the vice-like grip he had on the window frame, while Jeff tried to manhandle him back into the room. Come on, man, don't be crazy. You're gonna fall. Come on, come back in. There's plenty of air in here. I want more air! Daniel sobbed. Suddenly, through the rain and spray, he could just about see that there was a slow-moving lorry up front, in the same lane as they were. He was surprised that Paul had not started to indicate and move over into the next lane, because they were now coming up behind it really fast. He looked over to Paul, and to Daniel's horror, it looked like he was asleep at the wheel. 
He screamed out as loud as he could. Paul! Paul! Wake up! You're asleep! Paul didn't stir, so he shook him as hard as he dared and screamed again. Wake up! Wake up! We're going to crash! Paul slowly started to come round, but they were now almost on top of the lorry and about to crash into the back of it at 80 miles an hour. So Daniel had no other choice other than to grab the wheel and with only a split second to spare, he attempted to steer the murk around the lorry. He couldn't see what was coming up behind him, so prayed to the heavens that it would be clear. For Daniel, the whole tour so far had been dogged by insomnia, probably caused by the adrenaline rush of performing, and he was now surviving on very little sleep. As the hours ticked away, he would become more and more anxious about not getting any sleep, which was obviously counterproductive, because he needed to be getting calmer. He would get out of bed, pace up and down to try and make himself more and more tired, and then flop back into bed and try again. But then he would see the clock, and see that he only had four hours of sleep before he had to get up again, and the panic and unease would start again. Also, the thought of the rest of the band being fast asleep made him feel that he was on his own, the only one struggling with this terrible affliction, and it made him feel very isolated. Eventually, he would fall asleep out of pure nervous exhaustion, but only after four or five hours of mental and emotional distress. But if you rest or fail the test and never find your way Do you want to change your plea? Come on, Mr. Luckham. What is it to be? Lyra was now jumping up and down in the public gallery and frantically waving her arms to attract Daniel's attention. Daniel stared up at Lyra and mouthed, What? to her. What was she trying to tell him? Lyra, her frustration growing, increased her efforts and in desperation drew a big no in the air. Suddenly, the dirty penny dropped as Daniel realised what Lyra was trying to tell him. At the same time, it also dawned on him that this wasn't a game. This wasn't the school debating society, where he was arguing against being thrown out of some imaginary balloon. This was real life, with the possibility of serious consequences that could detrimentally impact his life. The magistrate by this time had noticed the rumpus that was going on in the gallery and turned his attention to the perpetrator. If that young lady in the gallery continues to remonstrate up there, I will have her forcibly removed and charged with a contempt of court. Now, Mr. Luckham, what is your plea? Here we go, we go, we go. Zombies on the night in 
he sat there quietly sobbing into his hands, he suddenly became aware of a sound echoing along the pipe. Could it be someone coming along to rescue him? He listened intently, trying to make out what it was. It was definitely coming towards him, and from the direction he'd just come from. He decided to move towards it, but just as he was about to start crawling again, something wet brushed by his hand. He pulled his hand away quickly. Could it have been a rat? He lit a match and looked along the pipe in the direction that the sound was coming from, and then saw four rats scampering towards him. He froze solid as the rats scurried past him. The noise was getting louder now, but he still couldn't make out what it was. And then a trickle of water washed over his hands, and immediately Daniel knew exactly what the sound was. It was the sound of approaching water. The best thing about the drugstore was that you could mingle amongst the trendy mini-skirted clientele without having to spend any money. Spot a nice looking girl thumbing through the records in the record store, sidle up to her and pretend to be looking for a record as well. Depending on what she was looking at, you'd then say something like, Great band. I'm really into those guys as well. Thought the second album was better though. Have you heard it? But unlike Alex's girls in A Clockwork Orange, more often than not, they would just shrug their shoulders and move away without even bothering to acknowledge your presence. Daniel thought that by the law of averages, if he kept trying this ploy, one day one of these beautiful and elusive creatures would deign to answer him. But so far, his success rate was a big fat zero. Somehow, they sense his desperation or just know that he was a penniless bum with no prospects. Open up your throttle wide We're gonna take a ride out on the wild side Look down for a fight Jump on your motorbike Open up your throttle wide Jump on your scooter boy Wind up your bright joy Ben was posing at the front of the stage, riffing away as if he was Hendrix, when suddenly he stopped dead, mid-phrase, and froze solid, long enough for the audience and Daniel to wonder what the hell was going on. And then the volcano erupted. He projectile vomited over the audience. They all screamed in disgust and tried to run back out of range, but the next load still managed to reach them. Ben then turned around to direct his torrent away from them and vomited all over Terry's drums. He bent over to direct the next load onto the floor and then, whilst trying to take his guitar off, slipped on the stinky sliming excreta and fell ass over tit into Terry's drums. Terry jumped off his stool, ran around and violently pulled him off his drums and ignoring the fact that Ben was covered in vomit, started to beat the fuck out of him to cheers and whoops from the audience. Apparently, to the audience, this spectacle was much more entertaining than the music, so they all gathered around the pugilists, shouting things like, Go on, my son! Knock his block off! Get stuck in! And give him one for me! Ben 